So today we have a very special individual who will be talking about CRDTs. These are conflict-free replicated data types. If you haven't heard of them, you should get to know them. They're, they're an amazing uh, pattern that, that will most likely, uh, well, <laughs> most likely, uh, definitely, uh, given category theory and the idea of commutativity, uh, <laughs> we can be certain that they will be here for quite some time. Uh, I'm not going to steal uh, this individual's thunder by going over them. Instead, I'm going to let him talk about how he's extended them uh, using in-memory replicated distributed uh, states. And basically, let's, let's ditch the, the database. And so without further ado, I give you William Huba. Great. Thank you for the intro. So a uh, quick little overview of what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, as we just mentioned, this talk is all about CRDTs, um, specifically using them to manage state across a distributed cluster on the beam. So I'm going to do a little bit of an explanation of CRDTs. Um, so if you're coming in without an understanding of them, don't worry. We'll, we'll give some background. Um, I'm going to talk about their usage in the wild, specifically other places um, related to the beam that are currently using CRDTs. Uh, some of the use cases where they make sense. Um, despite the, the title, they don't always make sense. And sometimes you do need a more uh, traditional database. Um, and I'm going to go into some details of the uh, Delta CRDT library, which is amazing. I didn't write this, but it's a fantastic library. Um, and then I've got, I've got some code to share. Um, so hopefully that'll be fun. So this is uh, the most commonly cited formal definition of a CRDT. I'm not going to verbatim read this. Um, the important things to really take out of this are the idea that CRDTs are a data type that can be um, uh, used to update nodes on a distributed cluster independently and concurrently um, without any kind of coordination layer. So you don't need a centralized node. Um, any inconsistencies will get resolved in a deterministic manner. Um, and it is uh, you know, eventually consistent. Um, at some point, the whole cluster will, will converge, but um, you don't necessarily have control or knowledge over the timing of that. Um, and another piece I really want to emphasize with this is there's no merge conflicts, right? Like Git as a protocol is, um, uh, shares a lot of properties, but Git obviously has merge conflicts that you have to manually resolve. Um, a property of CRDTs is that anything that you're going to transmit will be merged in some way. It may just be stomp over the other data, um, but you'll never get to a point where you can't take an update and apply it to your local state. So there's sort of three different types of CRDTs, uh, broadly speaking. Um, the original and kind of coarsest are uh, what, what are sort of called state-based CRDTs. Um, in these systems, the entire state is sent and, and merged in. Um, this is pretty reliable, but you know it's expensive. You're sending the entire state essentially every time there's a change. Um, you don't really see this too much in production real systems. Um, it's, um, it's really more of a you know, historical uh, origin of CRDTs more than anything else. Um, the second type is operational transforms. So with operational transforms, you are sending uh, the operation. You're saying like, append this bit of text at, at this spot. Um, and that record of transforms can be replayed. Uh, this is commonly used for like collaborative text editing, like Google Docs. Um, it has, uh, I don't know if this is a hard property, but usually at least you assume a reliable exactly once delivery method um, and the ordering matters for operational transforms. Um, you don't have sort of an index where you can get things out of order and end up having it make sense. Um, so that's the downside. The upside is it's super cheap. You're only sending these tiny little diffs. And then finally, the, the uh, kind of newest kid on the block is what's known as a delta state CRDTs. This is primarily what I'm going to be talking about. Um, delta states are super cool. Um, you have a combination of a data structure and a convergence algorithm. And like operational transforms, you're essentially only sending diffs. Um, just small little incremental bits of state. Um, but you are merging that into the bigger state rather than keeping a log of every bit of uh, transformation that's happened. 
So after you've sent and received and applied the, uh, the delta, you have your new state and you don't need to keep that original delta on, uh, around anymore. Um, most of the time, that means that you don't have to care about ordering anymore. Um, and you can even get things multiple times. Uh, it's not an issue. Um, there are, of course, edge cases where that may not get you to what you want. But again, CRDTs mean that you're not going to end up in a, uh, in a uh, merge conflict state. Um, so in theory, at least, delta states are both cheap and reliable. You get the best of both worlds. Um, and a quick note on some places where some of these systems are used. Um, you know, I'm sure React, everyone here is familiar with. Um, there's been a few talks about it. React is uh, primarily built on CRDTs. Um, distributed Redis, you know, right? Redis by default is all local, but when you uh, operate on as the distributed cluster of Redis nodes, that's using CRDTs. And uh, Phoenix Presence, which I'm going to talk about um, uh, it, in about two slides. I'll go into a little bit more detail. But uh, Phoenix Presence is super cool, and that is using uh, Delta CRDTs uh, to manage state. Um, oh, I thought this was one more, one more slide forward. So uh, yeah, so Phoenix Presence, if you're not familiar, um, is essentially an API in front of a pool of shards um, in the Phoenix web server. Each shard is routed by topic, uh, and there's a heartbeat protocol that replicates presence info using CRDTs uh, across a cluster. Um, so every node in the cluster is going to run this pool of shards. Um, and any updates, any diffs that are coming through are going to be sent over PubSub uh, and uh, to the clients. Um, so you have this kind of two-phased approach where on the server side, you have the heartbeats replicating CRDTs. Um, and then when the local state changes, uh, PubSub is used to broadcast that to all the connected clients. Primary use case for this is really for managing presence info, as the, the name implies. So think of like uh, online status in a chat room, for example. Um, the left side of this slide is what the uh, an example of what the state might look like. Uh, and the right side is what a diff coming in um, could look like. So everything gets broken out into uh, two keys, joins and leaves. Um, each thing under that will have a string key, uh, usually a user ID, but technically it's arbitrary what that key is. And then metadata. Um, so that metadata will all get uh, merged in together. Um, so if somebody joins, you'll send this diff that has you know, user123, status uh, is now online, or status is away, or whatever. Um, and then it'll get merged in. Uh, the PHX ref will reference a specific socket so that you know exactly where that, that connection is. Um, and so the merge protocol for this sort of looks like if the status changes for a given reference, you can overwrite it. If it's a new reference that you don't have, you would just merge it into your list. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, let's see. Yep. So that, I think that's um, all I want to say about Phoenix Presence. Um, the actual CRDD part is handled by this module Phoenix uh, tracking or tracker, I forget. Um, so you can actually implement your own, um, uh, your own like broadcasting in front of that or your own client. Um, and still use the same underlying server synchronization, which is pretty cool. Um, so I think it's a really good example of where CRTs make a lot of sense. Um, you know, some of the use cases that they're very strong at are where you want to you, you want to have like a distributed cache, um, or you have something that's very read heavy and you're rarely writing to it. Um, the important thing again, it's it's going to be eventually consistent. Uh, so you can't really rely on like transactions, for example, um, but you will eventually get everything synchronized across the cluster. So you want to share events around that are mostly locally relevant, but eventually the rest of the cluster needs to see them. Great use case for it. Um, persisting data, it's not that CRTTs can't do it, but there's nothing really built into the protocol. So you end up having to kind of write your own layer. Um, so for persistent data, something else is probably going to make more sense, or at least a CRDT feeding into something else. Um, relational data, like most of the time, you're going to be working on uh, on some type of map or a tree structure. Um, so relational data is kind of hard to do right now. Uh, maybe we'll get tooling there eventually to do it better. Um, and then any kind of like very large or very frequent write patterns. Um, the, all those diffs have to get sent across the whole cluster. Um, so those can be really, really expensive. And of course, any consistency. You're just not going to have read after write consistency 
uh, outside of your local node. So uh, Delta CRDT, um, not the, uh, the algorithm, but the library um, is pretty interesting. Uh, it's, it's a nice low level implementation of uh, one of the specific CRDT um, algorithms written in the, uh, in the original paper. I, I forget the, uh, the full title of the paper, but I have a reference to it at the end. Um, the author, uh, Derek Cron has written a, a few libraries that I'm actually gonna talk about here. Um, this gives you the semantics of a key value store. And under the hood, it uses a Merkle map, um, which is a Merkle tree built on top of Elixir maps. Um, and I'll go over Merkle trees in a second. Uh, and it uses that to synchronize across the cluster or across different processes running on the same node even. Um, so it's really built on top of the, the great distribution features of the beam. It has built in anti-entropy and joint decomposition, which means that deltas are not transmitted to nodes where they're not needed. Um, you kind of get the minimal set of uh, of network traffic you need in order to get the whole cluster converged. Uh, so the example on the right here, this is all obviously in, in one shell, but use your imagination and it works exactly the same across the cluster. Um, you can start two different uh, processes uh, using it under the Delta CRDT uh, gen server library. Um, you tell it what the neighbors are, um, you get a map structure by default, uh, and that's the, uh, the Merkle map kind of just being um, serialized as a normal Elixir map. And then you have a key value store. You can, you can put and get things from it um, and it will eventually synchronize to all the other processes. Super cool, very low level though, or I guess medium low level. So Horde is another library by the same author, uh, Derek Cron, um, which takes the Delta CRDT um, and builds a fantastic API on top of it to really show where it can uh, where it can shine. So what Horde does is provide a distributed supervision and process registry. Um, you know, un again, under the hood, it's all using the Delta CRDT library, but now you have the semantics for working with what would normally be a uh, dynamic supervisor or registry in Elixir, um, and have that work across your whole cluster. Um, that means that it, it's handling merge conflicts, it's handling state handoff, um, it's ensuring that that process is running just once. Uh, and if there's a net split, it'll run on both sides of the cluster. Uh, when the net split is resolved, um, one of those, pro one of those uh, uh, processes will go away and the state will get merged into the other one uh, in a way that you can define. Um, so the example code right here is in a module that's uh, uh, implementing the gen server behavior and Really, the only changes over a standard gen server are that your name registration is going to use this via tuple. So the uh, the via horde registry uh, in the bottom function, the via tuple function, uh, that will tell horde to assign this this process a name um, in the whole cluster rather than using only a local name. Uh, and then anywhere else in the in the cluster can use that same via tuple to look it up and send messages to it. Um, really handles a lot of the uh, a lot of the hard work for you for uh, for replicating across your cluster. All right, so I mentioned a minute ago that I was going to quickly go over Merkle trees. Um, so this is a, a you know pretty straightforward algorithm. I think um, the idea with a Merkle tree is that you have every leaf node labeled with a hash of its data, um, and then every non-leaf node leaf node is labeled with a hash of its own child nodes. Um, and so you uh, can build out more, more data, more nodes, and you end up recomputing the hashes at the top. The main property that we're concerned about here is this lets you very quickly figure out if there's a diff somewhere deep in here that you need to send an update for. So the uh, Delta CRDT library that, I'm, that I've been talking about uses an implementation of Merkle trees running on top of Elixir maps. Um, and that lets it very quickly figure out where changes need to be applied. Um, and where diffs need to be sent for um, different nodes in the cluster, um, because it has the hashes of the current state for those other nodes um, and knows uh, which pieces need to get sent out. Um, and if this sort of like uh, hash tree looks familiar, you may know of it from uh, blockchains. Um, so if anyone here is working in a company that is doing uh, 
uh, jargon-driven development, uh, you can tell your manager that you're implementing some blockchains when you start putting in CRDTs. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about where I'm specifically using um, Delta CRDTs. I am actually using the Horde library, um, and it's great, but I'm going to go into um, some of the other places where I'm more uh, more manually using the um, Delta CRDTs. So there's two, two big spots that I want to talk about. One is for event reporting. Um, so I have an application that's generating a bunch of events um, in a distributed cluster, and I have a centralized database recording those. They, they all report up to there. But there's an assumption that that may not be a completely reliable connection. There are some parts of the events that aren't immediately reported and may, may need to be retrieved later. Um, so I want those events to be saved across the cluster. I don't want to care about where, which node they were actually generated on. Um, this is you know, a, a backup store. Um, so the consistency guarantees don't really matter. Um, I don't really care about persistence necessarily. I just want. I want it to be a best effort across uh, across the cluster um, and ensure that any given node doesn't really matter. Um, and another important point here is all the events are immutable. So they need to be uh, um, you know, created once, synchronized out, and then they're not touched, they're only analyzed. The other use case that I have is for global configuration. Um, so for some parts of my application, there are configuration objects that are generated at runtime, but not at boot time. Um, you know, there's there's code that runs as like a startup task that creates this data, and that data needs to be shared across the cluster. Um, you know, one example would be if you're using something like uh, Let's Encrypt to generate a cert, you may want every node in your cluster behind a load balancer to uh, to share the same cert. Um, so you don't have to generate that uh, across all of them. Um, and if for whatever reason you can't pre-generate the cert and share it out, you would have to do it at runtime, and you could use something like this to share it out as config data. Um, so similar properties here, it's, you know, it, there are writes, it is um, updated over time, but for the most part, the configura configuration data patterns are very read heavy. Um, when I say read heavy though, it's not, uh, it's not an insane amount of traffic. It's, it's a medium amount of local reads um, and very, very, very few writes. Um, so that again is a good use case for Delta CRDTs. So um, diving into some code here, um, there's I'm gonna I'm gonna go quickly through this part. This is basically just a uh, a module that has a uh, a using macro in here, um, and what this is gonna do is set up uh, a reusable module that I can I can use for both the events. I can use it for the configuration data, and I can use it for anything else down the road. Um, so some of this is a little a little boilerplatey, but it it makes it pretty flexible. Um, and it'll all, all kind of be tied together at the end. So bear, bear with me, please. Um, so here we have a, uh, um, a couple things that are, I think, worth pointing out. Um, the module name is going to have a, uh, a new name created from it. That's uh, .crdt. Um, you can see that on line four. Um, there's going to end up being a process tree with uh, about four, with a supervisor and three gen servers under it. Um, for every module that's using this. Um, and I have a, a diagram coming up explaining that. Uh, within this module, there's then the, the supervisor module, um, which is pretty straightforward. Um, I have the, what the init looks like coming up in the next slide. Um, so just you know, use your imagination there for a second. Uh, and then the child spec for this is just going to get passed to that supervisor child spec. So you can throw, you can do, uh, you know, make something that's using the delta aviato.delta crdt and then throw that right into your supervision tree. Um, it'll get passed over to the crdt supervisor. So the init block for this for this uh, supervisor um, uh, looks roughly like this. Um, it makes three children. One is the delta crdt library, um, which is going to handle all the actual synchronization. One is a node listener, and the node listener is going to watch the cluster. Uh, figure out if anybody's joining or leaving it, and it's being passed the uh, the CRDT module uh, for its name. So anytime there's a change there, it's going to send a, a, a message to that other process. Um, and essentially what this ends up doing is keeping the CRDT membership list and the overall node list in sync. Um, 
slightly roundabout way of doing it, but uh, essentially what I was doing here was looking at the way Horde implements Delta CRDT and copying a lot of those patterns. Um, and it works pretty well. Like the code is uh, can be a, a bit hard to follow, but it's it's been pretty reliable. And then finally, the third child is your actual uh, module that's being defined here, um, which can do, you know, obviously whatever you want, but there's a couple things that it, it sort of needs to do. So this is the this is that code, the custom code. This is the uh, the default in the uh, Aviado Delta CRDT module, um, but you can override this with whatever you want. Um, this is making a member list for the CRDTs, um, and this is going to get those set member calls from the Horde node listener uh, and filter things out. So, an example where you might want to change this: imagine you had a cluster of however many nodes, and some subsection of those you want to um, synchronize CRDTs across, but you still want to connect it to the rest of the cluster for other reasons. Um, so I don't know, AWS uh, regions might be a good example. You have a cluster spanning multiple regions, um, but you only want the CRDT replicated to nodes that are in the same region. You could implement this handle call um, with for the set members, and then filter things out to just the parts you care about, set that as your Delta CRDT neighbors, and that's it, you're done. So a lot of boilerplate there. Um, like I said, this is, uh, you know, makes it really, really easy to reuse this module um, for multiple things. Um, so I'm gonna show that uh, next. I mentioned earlier that I have a use case of synchronizing events. Um, so the way I implemented that is to have uh, different adapters that you can you know, plug and play at configuration time. Um, this is roughly what the Delta CRDT one looks like. I you know, stripped out all of the kind of reporting functions to just give you the, the bare bones here, make it, make it nice and digestible. Um, so here you can see I'm using the aviato.deltacrdt. So all of that's getting defined in here. Um, there's a uh, store function, which is just getting in an event. Um, and in this case, let's say I have a, an event that has a flight ID on it. Um, on the Delta CRDT, I'm using that flight ID for its key. And then under that, I'm, I have a list of events. Um, that value can be anything, it doesn't matter. Um, what's going to happen here is every time that put call happens, uh, all the other nodes are going to have that value synchronized to it. Um, this is asynchronous, so you can't really, you know, you can't block or wait on this or anything like that. So again, you have to be fine with eventual consistency for this to make sense. Um, and then getting it back out, there's a, the second function in here, uh, flight events. Um, again, the API works just like a key value store, so I can just do delta crdt.get, pass it the, uh, the flight ID, and I'll get uh, I'll actually get a nil if there's nothing there, so I, I just map that to a to a list. Otherwise, I'll get all the events. Um, and then finally, I have uh, an all events call here. Um, so the the two map um, the at crdt here. If I go back real quick, um, the at crdt will be the the delta crdt process. Um, so calling two map on that will take the uh, the Merkle map and turn it back into an Elixir map. Uh, and then I can just get rid of all the keys here and just return the events um, as as one giant uh, flattened list. Uh, you know, potentially really expensive if there's a lot of data here, but um, could be useful for debugging. Um, and that's basically it. This is all that's needed to use that that uh, the module that I that I showed a minute ago and turn it into uh, a distributed event store. Uh, this is what the supervision tree ends up looking like. So you'd have your you know, top level application. Um, under that, there's the CRDT supervisor, which is which is defined by the by the reusable module, um, and then three gen servers under that: the Delta CRDT doing the actual synchronization. Um, oh, sorry, the dot CRDT is the actual synchronization. The dot Delta CRDT uh, lets you define the behavior for handling membership changes um, or anything else you need to do there and then the node listener to report on cluster changes. Um, so a second way I ended up wrapping this uh, is to turn it into an agent API. Um, the agent uh, module in Elixir does not have like a behavior that you can, you can very quickly wrap. So this is uh, you know, API compatible right now, but any changes to the uh, 
to the standard library agent or would require changes here, unfortunately. Um, but you know, other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we're using the Aviara.delta CRDT again, um, just defining all of the standard agent functions um, uh, and giving it a, a different cluster mod. So this is the, again, the part that is looking at membership changes um, and figuring out what to do in reference to the, the cluster. Um, in this case, it's doing a little bit more than that. Um, it's also handling the calls that the agent.server would normally have. Um, so by doing this, you can not only throw it into your application supervision tree, um, you can also throw it uh, into any agent calls and you can just use the normal agent API to interact with it, um, which has been like pretty nice, pretty convenient to just swap it in and out um, and get a distributed agent instead of just a local one. Um, so the init here looks pretty similar um, to, the, to previously. The one big difference is we're also doing an agent.server init um, and running that extra, extra process under this um, or as a, as a link process here. Um, uh, statically coded to agent data key for Delta CRDT. And then there's handle call, handle cast, and handle, uh, or sorry, not handle, code change, uh, which are all from the agent.server API. So whenever there's a Delta CRDT that comes in, uh, we do this process update call, um, just reads the data out of the uh, CRDT uh, Merkle map, um, applies the function, which is how the uh, the agent server works, if, you, if you're not familiar with that. Um, and then that data, gets passed directly to agent server to uh, update it locally. So there's a little bit of, co of uh, data duplication here, but um, the goal was again, to just make it API compatible with agents. Okay, so there's a, a few things here that I, you know, I mentioned are a little rough around the edges. So there's, there's some things I'm looking at doing in the near future. Um, first thing is just the code I just showed I'm planning to release as a library. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but this month. So in the next few weeks, I should be able to get that out. Um, the Merkle map, I mentioned that you have to call the kind of the two map to get everything out, um, or you call a read with a specific key. So it really only works one level down. Um, uh, if you want to get like nested updates or nested gets, uh, you can't really do that. You have to get the, the whole big chunk of data and then work on it as normal in-memory data. Um, so it hasn't been a problem yet, but I, I worry that down the road that could become a, a bottleneck. Um, and I'd like to look at getting better filtering access for it. Um, and similarly, like I'm doing a lot with list as values rather than uh, nested maps. Um, so it'd be nice to only send a diff for, for like the head if you're updating a list with just one new member rather than sending the entire list as a diff. Um, I think all that's possible. It just requires some changes with the with the data structure. It's not a CRDT limit, it's just a, a limitation of the, of the specific implementation. Um, and then finally, persistence. I, I know I said earlier that Delta CRDTs and CRTDs in general aren't great for persistence, but it's not an algorithmic problem. It is a just an implementation problem. It's not, it's not core to how CRDTs work. Um, so there's limited tooling around doing it. Um, I think there's definitely opportunity to hook CRTT diffs into just automatically persisting to like a, you know, rocks DB or even just like local flat files, um, and then being able to recover those, uh, even just for faster startup. Like it, you could trust that the rest of the cluster is going to catch up your node if it crashes. Um, but it may, may be nice if you have a lot of data to preload some state and then let everything sync up. Um, so that's all I have for you. Thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, I actually have some resources in the next slide that I'll leave you with um, uh, to check out. And uh, yeah, happy to take any questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> How did you get into CRDTs? Uh, I used to work on a um, collaborative document editor um, and got pretty deep into looking at the protocols of, of uh, some of the libraries I was using there. <clears throat> and then when I came across some of my more recent problems, I realized like the same, same sort of techniques could apply. Uh, how long ago was that? Uh, not that long, about a year ago. 
Um, I was using uh, Prosmere primarily, if anyone's familiar with that from the JavaScript world. Uh, that's cool. So it's not that difficult to throw yourself into them and actually pick them up. Or I mean, more. What yeah, would you say? So. That, that, let, me, let me actually ask a question. What do you, do, how, how long do you think it took you to actually really understand? I actually think the operational transforms are a little bit harder to understand than the Delta CRDTs. Um, and there's not, everything is sort of new, so there's not a ton of great resources out there to, uh, to kind of pick it apart. Um, but if you have familiarity with looking at protocols, looking at like network traffic in particular, um, it's pretty easy to, to process what's going on. None of, the, none of the data structures are particularly complicated. Well, th thank you very much for such a great talk. Um, does anybody else have a question? I think you made everyone experts now. That's the goal.